The Roman army's occupation of northern England was during the period of AD 71 to 74. Legionary fortresses were established at Chester and York. It was then necessary to construct a road between the two forts. The Pennine section of the road was constructed in the territory of the Brigantes. Auxiliary forts were established at Castleshaw and Slack, strategically placed for defence and communication on the Pennine section of the road. Marjorie, in his survey of Roman roads, tells us that the road leaves the fort at Slack and follows the A640 Oldham to Huddersfield Road, passing by March Hill on its way to Castleshaw. During the winter of 1973-74, the Huddersfield Archaeological Society excavated a linear feature running through pastureland at Moorside Edge. A trench cut at the right angle to the line revealed a road with two associated ditches, with metalling appearing at nine inches or so beneath the present ground surface. The road was some 22 feet wide, with a well-defined camber. This is characteristic style construction of a road built by Roman engineers. The excavated section of road appeared to be in some isolation. Its manner of construction was evidence that this was a route of some importance, particularly from its width of 22 feet. At its southern extremity, the road appeared to be making for the Upper Cone Valley and in the northern direction towards the fort at Slack. It was possible an alternative, easier route to use in winter had been discovered via the Cone Valley. The Roman fort at Slack was a first century construction of around 79 AD. The remains of the auxiliary fort are now preserved under the present golf course. Extensive excavations were carried out between 1913 and 1915 and again from 1958 to 63 in the fort, the annex to the north and the bathhouse. Several phases of rebuilding were discovered. The garrisons at Slack were withdrawn in approximately 140 AD, releasing the troops for service elsewhere. It is probable the fort was then completely abandoned having less than 100 years occupation. In early summer 1969, the Huddersfield Archaeological Society were involved in three days of rescue work on the site when the building of the M62 motorway cut through the civil settlement on the northerly side of the fort. Considerable quantities of Roman pottery and charred bone were recovered. The Roman fort at Castleshaw stands high above the village of Delft on a spur of land at the head of the Castleshaw Valley. Castleshaw is a typical auxiliary fort with turf ramparts, ditches and four timber gates and was built at the same time as Slack around 79 AD. It was abandoned and dismantled about AD 85 and lay empty until the beginning of the next century when a smaller second fort was built within the earlier defences. It was finally abandoned about 120 AD when many troops were transferred north to Hadrian's Wall. Here we see work being carried out by the Greater Manchester Archaeological Unit to survey, re-excavate and preserve the site. Marsden Moor in the upper reaches of the Combe Valley is now owned by the National Trust. This upland part of the central Pennines was first occupied by prehistoric man some 9,500 years ago. The summit of Poole Hill rises to 1,400 feet above sea level. Its lofty peak was chosen as a burial site in Neolithic Bronze Age times. Funerary vessels have been found from this period some 4,000 years ago. Here we see some of the flint implements recovered from the moorland area around Peel Hill. The earliest are from the Mesolithic period of around 7,500 BC to the later ones of the Neolithic Bronze Age, some 2,000 years BC. A glass bead, possibly from the Bronze Age period, was recovered from one of the sites. 
a group of highly polished pebbles were also recovered from a nearby site. In late autumn 1982, members of the Huddersfield and District Archaeological Society paid a visit to Pill Hill to record prehistoric finds in the wake of peat fires and subsequent soil erosion. In the course of field walking, a terrace way was noticed running along the southern side of Peel Hill. Although badly eroded, it appeared the terrace way may well have been metalled with small water-worn cobbles and was possibly a road. The terrace way was followed in an easterly direction for several hundred meters where more evidence of road material was noticed. It had been previously considered that the turnpike roads made under the direction of John Metcalfe, Blind Jack of Knaresborough, had been the first substantially engineered road across Peel Hill. He used the revolutionary method of laying bundles of heather on the moorland bogs as foundations to prevent the road sinking. The two roads were built in 1759 and 1781 respectively. The terrace way was followed in the direction of Whirlow, where extensive quarrying had taken place. Further possible road material was found where erosion had occurred. A line of curbstones were found, and on troweling away a light covering of peat, flagstones of a possible pack horse trackway were revealed. The following summer of 1983, after getting permission from the National Trust, members of the Huddersfield and District Archaeological Society started excavations on the pack horse section of the road. A fine example of well-preserved medieval pack horse trackway, some two and a half feet wide, consisting of large flagstones with smaller stones in between, was uncovered. The cobble metalling was found to extend out past the width of the medieval trackway for quite some distance, suggesting that the flagstones had been laid on a previously levelled surface. The medieval track of a Stanage from Yorkshire into Lancashire was the first acknowledged route. The discovery of an earlier road surface aroused considerable excitement among society members. It was possible that a riddle which had baffled historians for quite some time was about to be solved. The line of the main Roman military route from Chester to York, which passed through Castleshaw and on to the fort at Slack, has caused much controversy over the years. Sectioning the road revealed extensive foundations of quarried flags laid on much larger stone blocks. Above the flags were then laid water-worn cobbles with a thin layer of gravel for the final road surface. It is quite possible that most of the foundation stone material came from quarries a few hundred meters east at Whirlow, where a convenient outcrop of gritstone was available. We almost certainly had now uncovered part of the Chester to York Roman military way, built during the conquest of Northwest England under the command of General Agricola probably around 78 AD. This section of road would have connected the two Pennine forts of Castleshaw, some three miles to the west, and slack six miles in a northeasterly direction. The road is 12 feet wide, and excavations were extended beyond the exposed metalling, looking for evidence of a ditch, but nothing definite was found. Some 10 metres due south, at a slightly lower level, a second Roman road surface was discovered. It is possible that this second stretch was built as a diversion 
over a small area where the first road had been hit by landslips and partly washed away. The lower road runs parallel to the upper road and was traced by probing for several hundred meters due west. Again, water-worn cobbles were used in the construction of the road, but this time there was no evidence of quarried foundation material. On the Hophill side of the road, a very well-constructed stone-lined ditch was uncovered. This would have been necessary to carry away large quantities of surface water draining off the hillside. The ditch was constructed from small water-worn cobbles hammered hard into the underlying shale surface and was in an excellent state of preservation. This second road appears to have been originally 12 feet wide and was extended out to some 22 feet. This new alignment of road appears to have been constructed on a more stable section of moorland and coupled with an excellent ditch drainage system would have stood a much better chance of surviving this harsh upland climate with its heavy rainfall. A build-up of silt can be seen in the ditch section, overlain with several inches of peak growth. This clearly shows the curve of the ditch line. The stone line ditch was sectioned, revealing the underlying shale surface. In the upper surface of the road, an iron object was found, covered in a heavy concretion. When x-rayed, it was found to be a horseshoe. When sectioned, the road now clearly shows the absence of substantial foundation material. This was probably unnecessary because use was made of the underlying shale bedrock. On the lower side of the road, substantial quantities of silt were discovered, several feet in depth. This was quite possibly a result of ditch cleaning, which would have been carried out on a regular basis. The silt would have been carried across the road and dumped on the lower slope to prevent further contamination of the ditch. One hundred metres to the west of the back horse section and continuing along the same road level, another trench was dug after probing suggested a large amount of stone was present. On excavation, a culvert without the capstones was found. Foundation material was quite extensive with large stone blocks clearly defining the edge of the upper road. The culvert showed signs of repair and rebuilding. Most of the upper road metalling had been eroded away. It is quite possible that other culverts may well have been constructed at regular intervals along the road to drain rainwater away. No evidence of a ditch was found on the upper side of the road. Usual road construction practice would be to have a ditch on the upper side of the road connecting to culverts underneath the road surface, draining water away down the hillside. Excavation was extended for several metres along the line of the road and uncovered extensive foundation stones. The culvert was dismantled and a trench was opened up on the lower slope of the road. A stone line ditch, identical in construction to the one previously excavated 100 metres away, was found. This almost certainly is the ditch from the lower road. 
It would appear the two roads are converging close to this point. Surveys of the two roads were carried out. Levels were checked and continuity of the road lines were confirmed by probing methods. Excavations were completed for 1983 and during the following winter months and into the spring of 1984 members of the society carried out extensive field walking between Slack and Peel Hill to try and establish the line of the Roman road through the Cone Valley. Starting from the fort at Slack an attempt was made following existing footpaths and rights of way to link Slack with the previously excavated road section carried out at Moorside Edge during 1973. From Roundings Road, a quarter of a mile southwest of Slack, the road would appear to follow the line of an existing footpath skirting Round Hill on Old Stone Moor. On the summit of the hill, there is a well defined agar running for 100 metres across the fields, heading directly towards Peel Hill. Probing revealed considerable quantities of stone are buried below the existing turf and it would appear that there may well be associated ditches running alongside the line of the road. This is evidence of possible Roman construction. summit of the hill, passing by the site of a small radio relay station before starting its descent towards Bunkers Hill at Moorside Edge. The line of the road is not apparent down the hillside, but at some point must cut across the existing Rochdale Road. It is interesting to note that from the junction of Rochdale Road and Wallaclough Road, the length of road to Bunkers Hill is called Causeway and passes by a house called Causeway Foot. The use of the place name Causeway on a section of road is quite often associated with having Roman origins and at Bunkers Hill actually bisects the line of the suggested Roman road from Slack to Peel Hill. The road at its highest point on Round Hill, some 1,200 feet above sea level, as to make the descent to Marsden, three and a half miles distant at its lowest point, by the easiest route possible. The task facing the Roman engineers must have appeared quite formidable. The undrained valley bottoms would have been extremely marshy, and no doubt the hillsides very thickly wooded. In relative terms, almost 2,000 years ago, constructing a road through the Combe Valley must have been comparable to building the M62 motorway through the Pennines. The Roman surveyors would have marked out the line of the road and most likely the local Brigantian tribespeople would have been forced to carry out the heavy labouring work assisting the Roman engineers. The road leaves Bunkers Hill, running parallel to the existing Moorside Lane, before commencing its descent of the hillside down towards Clough House Bridge and the Ford or Bridge across Merrydale Clough. At a point close to the farmstead of West Stop, the Roman road leaves the existing lane by way of a raised agar in the top corner of the field and is in a good state of preservation for some 50 metres.
The descent continues towards the farmstead of Tidingfield. Unfortunately, modern agriculture appears to have destroyed visible signs of the road for some distance across the fields. to the schoolhouse, the Roman road crosses Hayes Lane, continue its descent towards Clough House Bridge. of road material can be seen where erosion has taken place, close to a line of trees running down the centre of the field. Again, sandstone cobbles have been used, identical to the upper road metalling used on Peel Hill. At Murraydale Clough, the Roman road has descended some 500 feet from Round Hill on Old Stone Moor. The Roman engineers have chosen the line of the road carefully, following the contours of the hillside and reducing gradients wherever possible. To cross Merrydale Clough, it would have been necessary to either build a bridge or construct a ford. There are still signs of extensive stonework and cobbling laid on the bed of the stream which may have Roman origins. <laughs> Leaving Merridale Clough, the course of the Roman road ascends the hillside heading towards the hamlet of Upper Holm. Probing has revealed road metalling exists under the turf a few metres to the west of existing North Lane. Yorkshire place names suggest the home portion of Upper Holm relates to a water meadow, but being built on a hillside and well away from water, it is unlikely. Another suggestion is that the name was a corruption of the Scandinavian name of Hawam. If this is correct, it is possible that the Viking travellers arrived in Hupperholm by way of the already existing Roman road. The majority of buildings now standing in Hupperholm appear to be mainly 18th and 19th century. The suggested line of the road leaves the hamlet of Upper Holm, crossing open meadowland, and when probing was carried out, considerable quantities of stone were found, some ten inches or so, below the turf. A survey was carried out, and it appeared there was a road of some importance awaiting discovery. The direct line of the road towards Pill Hill and Castleshaw is still being maintained. The road passes by way of Woodnook, heading towards Booth Bank, following the contours of the hillside and keeping well away from the marshy, impassable valley floor. It is possible that the road enters Booth Bank by way of the existing lane. 
At this point, the Roman engineers were faced with having to negotiate difficult terrain and the fast-flowing waters of the Clough. A bridge would have had to be constructed across the Clough and it is possible that the existing road bridge may well have been built on Roman foundations. The road leaves Booth Bank where a terraceway has been constructed hugging the curving contours of the steeply sloping hillside. The road at this point is some 12 feet wide and again the metalling consists of water-worn cobbles. Running along the 700 foot contour line we are well above the marshy conditions that existed on the valley floor and sheltered from the harsh upland winter climate which must have presented severe travel problems on the higher ground. We have now travelled some three miles in a southwesterly direction from the fort at Slack. In isolated sections, the Roman road has remained in an excellent state of preservation. In others, it has been completely destroyed by ploughing or erosion over the past 2,000 years. The line of the road is now heading towards its lowest elevation point and the crossing of the River Cone at Marsden, some two miles away. Culverts must have been a regular feature of the road construction and very similar to the one seen here. Between Boothbank and Crow Trees Road, we have what appears to be several hundred metres of roadway typical of Roman construction, but is still awaiting provenance. At Crow Trees, it is possible that the Roman road links up with the existing lane and may well be underneath the present road surface. The search was continued following the line of footpaths and trackways towards Marsden and at Greenhill Clough near Ashton Bin evidence of a ford constructed from large squared stone blocks was found. The crossing of many steep-sided cliffs was certainly a major engineering problem. A view of the whole of the northern side of the Combe Valley from Woodnook in the east to Marsden in the west gives us a very good idea of the difficult terrain that the Roman engineers would have been confronted with. The choice they had to make was whether to construct the road out of Marsden directly up the steep hillside to the upland plateau of 1,000 feet or take a more gradual line reducing the gradients by staying along the 700 foot contour line and gradually increasing the road elevation. The latter route was chosen, leaving Marsden and heading towards Durke Bank, staying on the same level to Ashton Bin, and then eastwards to Booth Bank and across the shoulder of the hillside to Upper Home. Further evidence of the Roman road line through the Combe Valley comes from the finding in 1587 of a possible Roman milestone in Booth Bank Clough. It is some five feet in height and 19 inches in diameter similar to others now in the British Museum. The cylindrical stone was taken to the 16th century Slathwaite Manor House where it was set in the grounds. 
A sundial was later attached to it, and it is now known as the Dial Stone. It is possible that the original name given to the stone could be a corruption of the term Dual Stone or Devil Stone, in the same way that the road over Blackstone Edge is called Dual or Devil's Causeway. Roman milestones were sometimes called Devil Stones. Slathwaite Manor House, built in 1560, is now the Dartmouth Estate Office and is one mile distant from Boothbank Clough. The original Slathwaite Old Manor House is some two miles away from its 16th century replacement. Built high on the hill overlooking Marsden, it is one of the oldest settlements in the Cone Valley, formerly the residence of the Tyas family. Part of the old hall still exists with crook timbers concealed behind a stone exterior. The place named Slathwaite was first recorded in 1178. Some claim that it means a clearing where timber was felled. Others suggest slow clearing. The line of the road was followed from the ford at Greenhill Clough, following the existing footpath towards Ashton Bin, where again metalling can be seen. Continuing westwards by way of Old House and Durka Bank towards Durka. The road then turns down across the field towards the church and the crossing of the River Combe before commencing the long hard climb of some 600 feet to the summit of Wurlow. Marsden was first mentioned in a document dated 1177 and was then known as Marches Dean or Boundary Valley. Here we see the ruin of the medieval chapel established in the 15th century when Marsden was in the parishes of Arnonbury and Huddersfield. In the 14th century Marsden was described as a forest two and a half miles long and two miles broad and was a hunting ground for the Lord of Pontefract. Conditions had probably changed very little since the Romans first set eyes on the valley almost 2,000 years ago. The later church, dedicated to St. Bartholomew, stands a short distance away from the medieval chapel, close to the banks of the River Combe. And it is somewhere near to the church that the Romans would have built a ford or bridge to cross the river. The line of the road would have passed close to the present railway station, descending through what is now the Vicarage Garden to the banks of the River Cone and the footbridge across the river. The footbridge has the appearance of a medieval packhorse bridge, but is of more recent construction, built as a shortcut for the local vicar to cross over the River Cone from the vicarage to the present church on the other bank. It is most likely the Roman engineers would have been confronted with a river much wider than at present. The building of the retaining embankment will have changed its appearance quite considerably. Also construction of upland reservoirs in the 19th century, impounding the waters of the Cone and its tributaries, will severely reduce the volume of water. 
In 1710, Marsden's first fulling mill was established at Hay Green for scouring and thickening woolen cloth. Spinning and weaving were done by families in the scattered farmhouses, the finishing being done in the mill. At this time, transport was still restricted to pack horses. Marsden would have been a welcome resting place in medieval times for the travellers making their way from Yorkshire into Lancashire before and after making the difficult crossing over Stanage, with its summit rising to 1,500 feet. After crossing the River Colne, the suggested line of the Roman road continues up the lane by the side of the church, before ascending the steep hillside up to the manor house, with its magnificent view down the Colne Valley. Throttle Nest on Old Mount Road, the medieval pack horse track rises by way of a cutting to the manor house at Highgate and appears to be following the line of the Roman road. The road into and out of Marsden on the trackway into Lancashire is known as the Pool Gate and in 1751 Thomas Percival wrote that the people of Marsden speak of the present highway being of some great antiquity. was built in 1616. John Wesley is said to have stayed the night here during one of his preaching tours of the area in 1746. The Roman road continues on past the manor house, ascending the steep hillside, again making maximum use of the contours. A raised agar has been constructed and probing has revealed road metalling a few inches under the turf. The agar is quite clearly visible for several hundred metres running across the field and appears to be in a perfect state of preservation. below the farm track leading to Hegau's farm. The Roman road is superb. Foundation material is overlain with small cobbles a few inches under the turf, again on a raised agar. chosen by the Roman engineers has once again avoided the valley floor. Apart from the brief crossing of the River Cone at Marsden, it has stayed on the better drained slopes of the hillsides. Above the farm track to Hegaus, Extensive quarrying has taken place. The Roman road and the medieval trackway have been almost completely destroyed. It is just possible to find a few metres of road metalling still surviving to give us a continuing line along the southern edge of the quarry up to the summit of Whirlow. 
Extensive quarrying in the late 18th and early 19th century has destroyed much of the original ground surface on the summit at Wurlow. 300 metres westwards, we now link up with the two sections of Roman Road excavated during the summer of 1983. Photographs of the road line were taken under light snow cover conditions, which can often show hidden features. The terraceway across Peel Hill can still be clearly seen and follows the 1200 foot contour line for 500 metres before making descent towards Gilbert's. Severe erosion has occurred where the road has been destroyed over a 75 metre section of shale bank. Sufficient road metalling still survives on the lower slope to give us a continuing alignment in the direction of Gilbert's. At this point the road builders would have been confronted with problems of marshy ground. Rainwater draining from the 1400 foot summit of Peel Hill leaves this area of ground permanently waterlogged. These were the conditions that John Metcalfe encountered when building the first turnpike road across Stanedge in 1759. In 1815, Metcalfe's road across the marshes was abandoned in favour of a new road which went from the old Moorcock across Car Clough to the south of Warcock Hill and Redbrook Reservoir to Stanage Foot. This second route is now a public footpath. Here we see part of Metcalfe's first turnpike road passing Gilbert's. It is possible that the Roman road may have been utilised in its construction. It is at this point the two roads appear to link up. After passing Gilbert's, the Roman road crosses the third turnpike road, the present A62, opened in 1839, and then has to negotiate Redbrook Clough before following the line of Metcalfe's first turnpike road towards Thieves Clough Bridge. A four-door bridge would have been required to cross Redbrook Clough before commencing the climb up to the summit of Stanage. Looking eastwards from below Thieves Clough Bridge, we can clearly see the straight alignment of Rick Metcalfe's first turnpike road. It now appears a distinct possibility that Metcalfe has utilised an earlier road alignment and the Roman surface may well be underneath the turnpike road. Society members have spent quite some time surveying and probing the moorland, looking for other road alignments but so far nothing has been found. Turning westwards towards Castleshaw, the road climbs gradually to the stomach of Stamage, passing over the bridge built under the direction of John Metcalfe in 1759. Thieveskloth Bridge is now isolated and derelict, but at the end of the 18th century was the scene of highway robbery and murder. Examination of the bridge was carried out by society members with particular interest in the foundations. Considering Metcalfe found it necessary to construct a road bridge across the cloth, it is a reasonable assumption that the Roman engineers would also have found it necessary to bridge the cloth. On further examination of the bridge foundations, it was found that Metcalfe's bridge was approximately 12 feet wide but foundation stones extended out to some 22 feet, which is the standard width of a full Roman road. 
further examination of the bridge structure is still required and also confirmation of a Roman surface underneath the turnpike road. Whilst working on the Roman road excavations on Peel Hill, field walking in the vicinity of Worlow was carried out. Examination of erosion patches uncovered sherds of Roman courseware and fragments of what appeared to be tile. In 1984, after getting further permission from the National Trust, it was decided to carry out excavations at Worlow. Several sections were excavated close to the quarried area. Sadly, very little of the original ground surface remains. Further sections were opened up on the site, away from the quarry edge, and in what appears to be mainly quarry backfilling, substantial quantities of Roman courseware sherds were found. In addition to the courseware, there were sherds of amphora and mortaria, pieces of tile, a few fragments of melon beads, Roman glass, bronze objects, iron slag, lead and some iron nails. Whetstones were also found, suggesting we had discovered a Roman occupation site. Work continued on in 1985 when the remains of a large circular fire and much more courseware was recovered, but so far there was no evidence of identifiable structure. The site has been measured at three Roman miles from Castleshore. The 1986 excavations commenced in May with a section cut on the southern side of the site where quarrying appeared not to have been carried out. This is close to where the possible signal fire was found. Halfway down the section, two slabs of stone had been laid on top of each other with what appeared to be packing stones underneath. In places the burning from the moorland fire which occurred a few years previously had penetrated to quite some depth leaving a reddened ashy deposit. Further sections were opened up and more Roman courseware and iron nails were recovered. In the finds bucket, we have sherds of pottery from several different vessels recovered from the backfilled trenches. Many rims of courseware vessels were also recovered in an excellent state of preservation. Continuing excavations on the southern side of the site was revealing that other features had survived the quarrying activity with another interesting group of stones starting to appear from under the peaty soil. The backfill trenches were extended with Roman finds continuing to be recovered. The pottery was compared to the finds from the Roman fort at Slack, kept at the Tolson Museum. Some of it was almost identical material, being Grimesca ware, made locally giving us a site occupation date sometime between 79 and 140 AD. Bon Spence holds a complete base of a recently recovered Roman earthenware vessel. Great care was taken to ensure that every item was recovered from the peaty soil by the enthusiastic excavation team. One of the better pottery finds was this complete base of a courseware vessel. It was in an excellent state of preservation and must have been very well fired during its manufacture it was found below an alignment of stone slabs, which could possibly be part of some structure. Sadly, an, only a small portion 
of the body of the vessel remained. More iron nails and courseware were found nearby. The slab of stone on which the base of the vessel was placed to be photographed is very interesting. It has been ground and polished to give a very smooth finish. Its use is unknown. This was the most complete earthenware base recovered. The majority of courseware was fragmented. Work has now been going on for several weeks and we are still looking for evidence that some form of structure has survived the quarrying activity which has destroyed a large part of the site. Perhaps it was Russell's sculpture in stone which brought us much needed luck. Opening up another section on the south side of the site revealed a further section of two courses of slab stones with underlying packing stones lining up with two previously found. It was now becoming apparent that after two years of searching we had come across the rampart of a defensive structure Having previously found the site of a large circular fire, it was looking hopeful that we could possibly have uncovered the remains of a Roman signal station, which had both an inner and outer rampart. County archaeologists Phil Mays from the Greater Manchester Unit and John Hedges from the West Yorkshire Unit visit the site. While the Huddersfield and District Archaeological Society have been working on Peel Hill, the Greater Manchester Archaeological Unit have been re-excavating the site of the Castleshaw Roman Fort, led by project manager Dave Start. Here we see the team, along with county archaeologist Phil Mays, paying us a visit to have a look at our latest discoveries. One of the major problems we are faced with on the site is trying to decide how much of the Roman defensive structure has been destroyed and removed by the quarry workers. It is most likely that they will have reused any useful stone blocks that they found on the site. It is possible that the 18th and 19th century quarry workers may not have been aware that they were working on a Roman site. The usual practice of the Roman army on abandoning a site was to completely dismantle any defensive structure down to foundation level. There are no previous documented reports of Roman finds from Werlow. After finding evidence of structure on the southerly side of the site, it was decided to chase any further rampart extensions by probing and then carrying out small intermediate sections. It was discovered that we had part of a rectangular defensive rampart. Sadly, the westerly side of the complex had been extensively robbed for stone, leaving only rubble and foundation material. Nevertheless, we still have approximately one-third of the outline of the Roman signal station remaining.
the signal station as both an inner and outer defensive rampart. A small section of inner rampart was left reasonably intact. rampart, the remains of turfs were uncovered. It would appear that the bulk of the defensive structure was built from turfs stacked to a few meters in height and having stone slabs a few courses high for the foundations. The discovery of a considerable quantity of iron nails from various parts of the site lends us to believe that a timber structure was an integral part of the complex. There may also have been a timber palisade built into the defences. Throughout the excavation, photographs and drawings were made of the site, detailing various sections that were examined and the artefacts recovered. Drawings of the defensive ramparts were added to the overall site plan. The complete excavation of the two Roman roads and the signal station at Worlow will eventually be published by the Society. discovery of the Roman roads on Peel Hill and now the signal station allows us to ponder a while on the writings of the Antonine itinerary compiled around 200 AD. It is stated in the itinerary that a station existed some 18 Roman miles in a northeasterly direction on the road from Manchester to York. At Worlow we are precisely this distance along the line of the road. The finding of considerable quantities of Roman artefacts and the ramparts of a structure imply that the long lost Roman station of Cambodunum could possibly be in the vicinity of Marsden. The signal station at Worlow may well have been garrisoned from a nearby fort. Artefacts recovered from the excavations at Worlow between 1984 and 1986 are seen here on display. Preliminary examination of the pottery by Manchester University have by methods of association with similar material from other Roman sites dated the earliest pottery to around 78 AD and the latest to approximately 150 AD. Several whetstones were excavated from the site. They would have been used for sharpening swords and other tools. Small pieces of Roman glass were also recovered from the trenches. The pottery finds consist of courseware, Manchester greyware, black burnished ware, Grimsker ware, which is a red earthenware manufactured locally at the Grimsker site near to the fort at Slack. Also we have rusticated pottery of unknown origins and red earthenware from Holt, the legionary works depot in North Wales. Considerable quantities of iron nails were recovered. Other finds were fragments of melon beads, bronze objects, sherds of amphora and mortaria, 
pieces of tile, along with iron slag and lead. A fine example of a Roman Delobra was recovered from one of the sections. This would have been similar to a modern day pickaxe. After waiting for suitable dry weather conditions, the polythene sheeting which had covered the signal fire was taken away and excavation work commenced. The signal fire would probably only have been lit if danger was imminent. Other messages would no doubt be conveyed by runner to the forts at Castleshaw or Slack. Neither the fort at Castleshaw or Slack is visible from Worlow, so it is possible that further signal stations would be necessary to receive information from strategically placed sites on the hillsides above the two forts. The many layers of charcoal and ash were sectioned and it can be seen that they are several inches in depth with the lower layers lying on a platform of stone slabs. In between the layers of charcoal were thin bands of silty material which could possibly imply that longish intervals of time elapsed between fires being lit. Amongst the layers of charcoal in section was found a shirt of Roman pottery. Further excavation was commenced in the interior of the site, attempting to trace the line of the Roman road into the signal station. Pilot trenches were dug after probing suggested that road metalling could be present. A continuation of the stone line ditch, contemporary with the lower of the two previously excavated Roman roads, was revealed. It would appear that parts of the road still survives underneath the quarry spoil. sixth season, although dogged by bad weather, has proved to be a very successful year. The finding of the rectangular defensive structure, with its inner and outer ramparts, being the most important discovery of the year. It is now time for filling in, returning the quite considerable quantities of spoil back into the excavated trenches, and then re-turfing the area.
The final excavation work of the 1986 season was to section a culvert, apparently taking water from the drainage ditch off the Roman Road and hillside and feeding it some half a mile or so down the hillside towards Marsden Golf Course and possibly to a Roman site still awaiting discovery. The culvert would have been capable of carrying large quantities of water. Excavation revealed the width and depth of the watercourse and also that in parts it had been clay lined. attempt was made to trace the culvert down the hillside towards the golf course. Sections still survive until its final destruction by various quarry and farm trucks and the crossing of Metcalfe's Turnpike Road. The purpose of a culvert capable of taking substantial quantities of water towards the present golf course leads one to conjecture that it may well have been constructed to supply water to a bathhouse. Marsden may well have other hidden secrets awaiting discovery. In September 1987, with the permission of the landowner, the Huddersfield and District Archaeological Society carried out a pilot excavation in Meadowland between the hamlet of Upperholm and Woodnook to determine that the suggested line of the Roman road through the Combe Valley was correct. Field walking and subsequent probing in late autumn 1983 had suggested that a considerable amount of stone lay some ten inches or so below the turf. Initial surveying had intimated that the stony layer was 22 feet wide and ran for a great distance across the meadow. Upper Home is approximately the halfway point between Peel Hill and Moorside Edge where fine examples of Roman Road have already been discovered and excavated. A trench was cut at the right angle to the line, revealing a 22-foot wide metalled road with a well-defined camber and at least one ditch, very typical of Roman construction. conditions of the field, it was decided not to section the road, but to excavate a trench along the upper side of the road and examine the foundation material. Sectioning the road will give us confirmation that the road is of Roman construction. to the discovery of the road at Upper Home by the Society members, there was no previous knowledge that a road existed running across the Meadowland. The field was ploughed for reseeding a few years ago. Fortunately, the plough had not disturbed the road surface, which has remained intact in an excellent state of preservation.
the cobbling of the upper road surface has been laid on quite substantial foundations. The pilot excavation has uncovered sufficient evidence that the road at Upper Holm is almost certainly of Roman construction. We can now say with confidence that the line of a Roman road from Castleshaw to Slack runs through the Cone Valley. In his survey of Roman roads in Britain, Marjorie gives the road from Chester to York the number 712, which he suggests follows the line of the A640 Oldham to Huddersfield Road over Buckstones, passing by way of March Hill on its way to Slack. In view of the fact that no evidence of a Roman road has so far been proven on the line that Marjorie suggests, is it possible that the road listed in the Antonine itinerary, drawn up in 200 AD, is the same road constructed under the direction of General Agricola around 79 AD that runs through the Cone Valley.
Excavation of the road continued under difficult waterlogged conditions. The trench on the upper side of the road was excavated to determine the depth of the foundations. passed since the finding of the isolated section of Roman Road at Moorside Edge and the discovery of the two roads on Peel Hill and the signal station at Worlow plus the location of the line of the Roman Road through the Cone Valley. They have in themselves been most rewarding. Research work goes on by members of the Huddersfield and District Archaeological Society and who knows, there may well be even greater discoveries awaiting us.